Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Airlock, and this is a talk about philosophy and the analytic and continental traditions of modern European philosophy. If you watch my last talk, and I am giving classes this semester at Berkeley City College, and these are the lectures for those classes, in modern European East Asian and logic uh, in philosophy, as far as philosophy, all the same department. I left off with saying that we would cover some medieval to modern and then some of the analytic and continental divide. Now, this talk is going to be about analytic and continental philosophy, and I'm going to take my time working through some of the medieval uh, stuff, which I will then put in with the logic and the, and the European philosophy. Because for logic and for East Asian philosophy, we cover some and less of medieval European philosophy. You can always bring in philosophy whenever it's like or not like Chinese or medieval European philosophy, whenever you like with other philosophy, comparatively, uh, as philosophy as a whole even, uh, without using the word comparative. But at the same time, um, it is appropriate to bring up analytic and modern continental philosophy because first came continental in a sense and then came analytic, although actually the two are called as such in response to the split in the last hundred years about, actually, from World War I onward, actually, which is a hundred years ago, pretty much. Very much. So, and again, had a depression or something or other between then. And a lot of interesting political events, yes, over the last hundred years. So one of the things that's happened over the last hundred years since World War I in Europe and America, and with the white folks like myself in Americas, and everybody else involved, is modern European philosophy in the Anglophonic world has very much in America and in Britain become the analytic tradition, and French and German thought is very much called the continent, uh, continental philosophy, which would be the mainland of Europe versus the islands of Britain, including the Scots and the Irish, if they do, and then, and their interests. And you would basically then have analytic philosophy in South Africa, Australia, I was alive in the 80s. And then you also have uh, Americas, and then there's Spanish-American philosophy, as mentioned in uh, Espanol, and is quite Hispanic thus, but Anglophonic philosophy, like I'm talking the English to you, the English, Anglican, English, English, that, I repeat myself though, is we have Anglophonic philosophy. I am a white American from California out here in Berkeley uh, town and uh, loud and proud and interested in all of that. And we have here, uh, Berkeley is a very powerful and central department in a lot of American philosophy. It is ranked up and down the board in ways, I'm not gonna get into that, but it is a very powerful analytic tradition that uh, of the analytic uh, mind and co uh, culture. The more powerful and kind of better funded the university uh, that you find, oftentimes you find it being more analytic and American uh, in the philosophy department. And then English and history departments tend to be in continental thought and German and French ideas, but the philosophy departments of America are very analytic dominated. Why is that? This is a short talk. I am going to try to keep my tangents to further lectures. I always go on long flights of reasoning, as uh, Deleuze and Guattari say of Nietzsche themselves, and perhaps we're thinking of me and anybody randomly. That essentially, I like continental thought. I like analytic thought, the bits of it I like. I really like Wittgenstein. I am very indebted to Hans Luga, Barry Stroud, Hubert Dreyfus, several others, including Searle, eh, who have been continental thinkers, but also folks who are more so, less so Searle, are oriented around the analytic tradition. I am frustrated with the analytic tradition, but I will talk through that and give you the history of it rather than my opinions and tangents right here. This is a talk that I am going to include for all my classes in the future because actually understanding why American philosophy is very Anglican, Anglophonic, analytic, and not into even so much the Greeks anymore as much as American philosophy and not so much into German and French stuff and you will find more German and French ideas in art, history, English departments, certainly than you would find necessarily in American analytic philosophy departments. I am frustrated with that, but I'm not going to share with you my personal preferences as much as I'm going to frame history the way I see it, of course, which is plenty in line with my preferences, oddly enough. And uh, they're past a cat, I think most invisibly. The uh, Essentially, I am like Kant's categories, you know, which are still most invisible. I'm going to give a talk about analytic and continental philosophy, a little bit of a cynical history uh, quickly, and why these things exist the way they are, and then you can think a lot of ways, can't you, after that? 
So we're in modern European philosophy. It is typical to study Descartes through Kant, which is very basis analytic. Uh, Descartes and Kant are German, uh, French, a French and a German thinker, and there are French and British and German thinkers in early modern European philosophy. Often what is taught and was taught to me as 20B, which is one of my courses uh, and one of these classes here I'm talking to, at, with, and that's shared by both the continental and the uh, analytic tradition. The analytic tradition very much likes Kant and does not like Hegel. And it is very much between Kant and Hegel. Hegel had a student named, uh, or at least a follower, not a direct student perhaps, named Marx. I do believe Marx did not ever take a class with Hegel, but was quite the left-wing Hegelian by name. It is with Hegel and the backs and forths. Angela Davis knows a lot about Hegel. Martin Luther King Jr. knew a lot about Hegel. Um, it is not typical for American philosophy departments to teach Hegel. I got a Hegel class with a Swabian German thinker. They, they apparently bust in from Germany. You know, it's a long bus ride. And he was like, they, he said, uh, feminists are using Hegel for things like a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. You know, 10 seconds and counting, Mr. Bond. Nine, eight. It's like, no missiles, you know, you know for the Anglophonic world, yes? A uh, little uh, East German. So, Essentially, with all of this stuff, you have a lot of history. You have a lot of culture set up. There's a lot of philosophy in English. There's a lot of philosophy in Spanish. There's a lot of, a lot of philosophy in French and German. And then there's a lot of philosophy in Chinese, Indian aside. And even Greek, believe it or not, still today. Uh, it's all ancient. So, I believe there's modern Greek philosophers. I don't know of any by name, unfortunately. Uh, much of Greek philosophy thus would be, as far as we bill it, ancient. Yes? Which modern Greek philosophers are these Western folks turning to? You have several different cultures that exist in history of philosophy, which is sort of talking about talking, thinking about thinking, saying what is the big perspective, man, woman, non-gendered peoples, gendered, non-gendered, all of us. Uh, modern European philosophy taught in American universities typically covers Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Locke, Berkeley, for whom this town is mispronounced as Berkeley, and Kant with few additions. While courses in Hegel, Nietzsche, and Heidegger are offered as electives, the core classes, and I had Sluga for Nietzsche, Wittgenstein had Stroud for things, Heidegger with Dreyfus. I'm very thankful that I had those classes here in this town. They're often those continental, though, French and German central thinkers who are very important to the culture and global culture, as well as anything Western. And anything Christian, post-Christian, secular, all of this, secular is many types of Protestants get along. It was, it still is for many folks, speak more conservatively. That basically French, German, Indian, Chinese, anything. Usually you would never find Indian philosophy classes offered if East Asian, which I am teaching, or Chinese philosophy increasingly offered. Uh, Buddhist philosophy I teach. French, German philosophy as continental classes in Nietzsche. Those are always offered as electives. Those are not core classes uh, in a philosophy major often in America today. I am not in each state of the Union, but that is certainly California, and that's California. So, thus... Essentially, um, they are taught, uh, most philosophy classes and core classes are taught from a uh, somewhat rigidly designated as such uh, in the catalog. Analytic perspective, primarily by using works of American analytic philosophers. Sometimes there's Brits, often there's Wittgenstein uh, lurking in the wings, although as many an analytic has said, Wittgenstein goes too far, and then I guess they don't want to go farther at their words that way. So the analytic tradition continues after Kant to study first Analytic philosophers, uh, Frege from Germany. I am uh, indebted to Hans Sluge. He has an excellent book about Frege that I rely upon uh, in the English. That uh, and he is a Germanic person translating several German, you know, things for Anglophonics like myself here. That uh, you have Russell, he speaks the, uh, the American English, but with the Queen. Uh, Russell from Britain and Wittgenstein from Austria, sort of a Germanic. Again, Freud was too, but not enough for his fellow Germanics, although it wasn't that he was Austrian. After the initial German and Austrian, most analytic philosophy comes from the English-speaking countries of Britain and America. Also, South Africa, you will see Australian philosophers are cutting in on the action now. The continental tradition largely consists of German and French thought, and continues after Kant to study the German philosophers Hegel, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and then several French philosophers sort of camp together as post-structuralism, post-modernism, or in that direction. Uh, you may have heard post-modernism, oh no, oh no, oh no. That would kind of be German-French continental thought telling us we have social perspective beyond strict logical truth with science. 
And people are somewhat loving and hating romantically and strictly in all of those ways we do things. Loving and hating all of that. The romanticism, the science, the logical, the illogical. And that's what we're going to be talking about, not just here, very briefly. But going to be mentioning all this as context of the lectures, continuously. I do. Have to. Doesn't position it, you know, well for people to see unless you do. So this is very much the overview. Like philosophy. Talking about talking. Why the split between the two camps? Two strains of thought, and of course I don't have every butterfly flapping its wings and know of each and every hurricane, and have each and every strand of causation, but in mind. But two strands of thought went in very opposite directions from Germany, in fact, as Sluga knows well. The continental tradition embracing Hegel, the analytic tradition rejecting him very much, and, con and sticking with Kant, and being neo-Kantian. And continental thinkers influenced by then well, sometimes both, but are more so leaning against strict Kantianism, although continental thinkers can be as Kant as they like, as are as many, uh, and I had good lectures on, it's very much after Kant. Uh, uh, Greek thought is plenty after Plato, at least that's, I think, Whitehead, um, that's, and he's after Plato, certainly, but continental thought is very much after Kant and Hegel, and that's very much what we're talking about. Kant and Hegel are, Hegel is writing his his primary works in, like, the 1800 teens, so, you know, 1811, 1816, uh, things like that. So the early 1800s is when Kant, uh, Hegel is breaking away from Kant in the latest of 1700s. Keep in mind, Europeans got more wealth and power than the Muslims between 1600 and 1700, right when Isaac Newton owned a wig or two. Not sure, haven't counted them quantitatively. But you basically have Isaac Newton in 1600, 1700, and then by seven, late 1700s, the Europeans have more money and power, are saying we are science, not just Sumer and Babylon and Muslims also do science. We could do that too, and algebra. No, 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 no. Now Europe is science itself, and it's, and it's increasingly with Protestants Greek, not Roman, which is more their direct ancestry politically. Greek, as they are actually taking the Latin as Protestant New Testament and finding it in the original Greek. We do not have the New Testament in Aramaic, and those biblical uh, works are central, of course, to people's lives and cultures. So this is all, of course, social, political, historical, all of that. And I am not here, if you think I am, value judging and saying Christianity is better or worse than Buddhism or white people are not. We are talking about large human historical patterns and wealth and power changing hands, and I am very much leaving who you like or don't like of all these Germans and Muslims and everyone else completely, as I am talking, off the table. I can and can't, and I joke. But of course, and I joke about the Germans, I have a German last name, I'm very Germanic, what does that mean to white Americans? I do not know, and neither do you, that's World War I and World War II, culturally, the construction of whiteness, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'm just white, you know, am I German? Sort of. Did my family dance on benches with lederhosen? No, you know. So yeah, I'm German, sure. I'm very white American after World War II, which is cultural. And them's a construction of sorts. You just don't need no hammers nor nails. So you need social movements back and forth, talking to people. Who wants to do that? Again, we'll talk more of that out with logic. I go back and return to the notes. So Hegel became conservative later in life. His thinking spelled out the path of radical change and revolution, though. Hegel saw history uh, as a battle between right and left, actually, uh, the French Revolution. As a boy, he saw the French Revolution, he's like, yeah, man. And then later he's like, well, I'm now a more conservative suburban dad. I think things go back and forth, but they end up in white Protestantism with us, you know. And then history stopped, as Hegel says in the 1800s. Of course it didn't. Now we got the internets uh, on the inner tubes here. Basically, history doesn't stop, but Hegel says history is going to stop in objectivity and science with white people, and uh, which he calls, you know, Christendom. Um, and wouldn't really use, could use, and, and possibly did, but did not often use the word white as we would after World War I and World War II, in which more so it's less Christendom and includes Catholics, oddly enough, in Christendom. Who wants to do that with the Irish? But, also, but we don't want the Irish. And also white Jewish people, increasingly after uh, Auschwitz in academia, which was not only increasing, but there in Americas and elsewhere, more so than Europe somewhat. And yeah. Uh, all that didn't play nice together other than talking about the West increasingly, which is white and white increasingly. Actually, West, white. This is the history, somewhat, of the philosophy side of a lot of that. These aren't the people, uh, Hegel and Kant are not the people whom, to whom people went to get their identities. 
But this is, a very, again, a lot of the structure of how people have thought and the cultures very much build up through this. To Hegel is one of the guys who says, we Europeans have come from the Greeks, Romans, remember that, and then we are now science and objectivity and logical as a superior culture to Hawaiians, let's say. He doesn't say the Hawaiians. He actually leaves out mostly the Chinese. He talks about the Indians as zero Buddhism, and then we just go on from Buddhism above it, I suppose, with very little knowledge of Indian philosophy. And we're going up from the Greeks to become Protestantism and science. And then that is I, the mind of God on earth, effectively, in the 1800s um, as law and rights and the back and the forth. Hegel says this. People still very much parrot Hegel and talk like Hegel, whether or not they're Kantian or Hegelian or analytic or continental. So Karl Marx, who was the co-author of the Communist Manifesto with Engels, uh, that he was the, I want to make a joke about Engels and dialectic, I won't. I will leave this to you. And the found, he was the somewhat founding philosopher father of communism and Marxism. Um, Marx argued society was in need of radical revolution and change, given Hegel's thinking, and that just as the French Revolution, it is explicitly in the Communist Manifesto, which you should read whether or not you, especially if you love or hate it, um, that a communist revolution, don't be afraid to read propaganda, you know what I mean? Just do that, you know? especially if you're calling it propaganda, that a communist revolution, uh, Marx says, and I am not the Marxist, um, I am not, would remove the capitalists from the top of society, such uh, like the French Revolution, remove the aristocrats and the clergy. He says, well, in that stage, you had the Catholic Church owned at least more than 10% of the property of France, if not more, and then that frees up you know, a lot of the economy. Protestants here would find that funny because it's Catholics, you know, it's a Catholic church. I wouldn't find it funny otherwise, is, uh, at least within Christendom, that you basically find the French Revolution is like, well, nuts to the aristocrats and nuts to choppy choppy time, you know, the church. And so then you have, yeah, the commun basically Marx is like, and communism is going to be the next French Revolution. Left-wing people oftentimes like talking about uh, the Nazis. Oftentimes you will find conservatives talking about the chaos of Robespierre and the French Revolution. They used to. Now it's popular for everybody to call each other Hitler. It was, up until recently, popular for the right to say the left-wing, Antifa, whatever, although that's now, you know, the thing wasn't before, that these radical lefties are all the French Revolution Robespierre chaos, which does make a bit more uh, historical sense than the left are the Nazis. But let's pass all that rhetoric and argument by, and let's keep going here. So Britain and America, who are now and were increasingly after World War I, destroyed the continent, and then World War II shook up Europe again, Britain after World War I, and then America after World War II, became the wealthiest countries in the world as the Anglophonics I say to you here and now on the YouTubes out here in California, eh? which could be Spanish-speaking and is plenty, but ain't entirely, is it, now? Which is how you understand the words, good, or the subtitles here. Uh, all in process and uh, circuit. So, basically, um, Hegel and Marx are somewhat shunned in the Anglophonic world, believe it or not. In the process of World War I and World War II, I think there's something like the Soviet Union, communism, and then China. So, in the process, Americans very much backed away culturally from anything like Hegel or Marx and said, let's go back strictly to neo-Kantianism and Kant. This is interwoven with many other factors. It isn't this produced it alone, but... But looking at the larger con continent, <laughs> all of them, to this day, we uh, people debate five, six, seven continents, how many? And of course, it's a duck rabbit a bit, ain't it? About large land masses, because we can judge things so objectively. Counting with the number words, you know, since there are snakes. Basically, several scholars say and have said it is only with the fall of the USSR in 1991, I believe, I ain't the historian, that's what I put in the notes, that Americans began to study Hegel. I lived through all of that, actually, when I was still very young, and I heard people talking about a strange monster named Reagan that roamed the land, devouring the futures of children. I was raised more in hippie-ish land. I don't know what monsters others are taught to believe in or not, but Americans began to study Hegel again once the uh, rush had fallen, and now we still don't, but do a bit. I would say, actually, that's Hegelian professors, my Swabian uh, somewhat import, as well as I would say that's any uh, Sluga teaching me Nietzsche, or even a deeper Wittgenstein, and yeah, like that's actually Andreyfus dabbling in Heidegger uh, here in Berkeley Town. Very much. 
I mean, it was 80s and the 90s. Maybe they were ahead of the gun, but yeah. Like, I would say 70s, 80s. That that makes the sense to me. And again, I'm happy to figure out that better with others, you know. It is, or I imagine others are, have figured that out better than me, and I can listen to them is what I mean. So it has been that continental, it has been said, and this is a wonderful phrase that's worth keeping in mind. Continental philosophy is rather romantic. Continental philosophy wants to be art, while analytic philosophy wants to be science. I forget who, uh, you know, who said that and where I read that first. And I don't think somebody said that. I read that uh, to me. So with the eyes rather than the ears, you know, and the faces, etc. But uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Basically, there are uh, science in World War I and World War II is very much industry, is very much the modern world. You may notice that everyone on all sides of things love and hate modern technology and love and hate smartphones and love and hate the internet and love and hate science, right? Especially with the latest political movements. People love and hate the internet. They love and hate the mind. They love and hate reason. They love and hate human interpretation. And now they get to decide whether science is good or bad and religion was good or bad. Well, guess what? With a whole range of human beings, it was all of that all day long for thousands of years. I don't know when science started, but I am one to say we don't separate ourselves with psychology from the Hopi and say there are illogical people who never use technology. You can debate how mythological you may or may not think they are. I definitely come from the side the Hopi are somewhat technological. I do not need to impress you with the opinions they are not as or were not, especially if they were, and I would believe they were. An oral culture, which would be illiterate, does not have the strict, one could say, technology of text, and do not need it with full human brain. Brains. That you do not, we do not need to wait for math or text, and probably those came strictly closer together than oral traditions may or may not have soaked that up from city states. Quantitative reasoning as a subset or inner reworking of verbal and visual reasoning, which did not exist if you read those uh, Don't Sleep There Are Snakes beforehand. So, what we have in the current world is people don't know how logical or scientific the mind is. We have a lot of power with religion, money, science, all of it internetworked. And you have different cultures today who believe that religion, science is superior to other cultures because of what they see. Actually, the social sciences do not show us that we have superior reasoning or logic or verbiage, verbal, emotive reasoning. I'm going to get into detail about that increasingly. That all of these things networked a la Wittgenstein are not us and not the Hawaiians or not. We would not even begin to translate texts or empathize with Hawaiians be like, they went a hunting if we could not do that. And I mean, the most racist people can easily identify with the Hawaiians and then not. So that's human reasoning and the full range of it, whether you like it or not. I will get into further detail on all of that, but what I am ranting and raving beyond the notes about here is analytic philosophy very much wants to be logic and science, and that part of human success in this culture and others. Continental thought in the course of World War I and then World War II decided that strictly being square in science and reasonable is not as groovy and cool and feely and meaningful semantics as art. In a certain sense, and I still think it is worthy of teaching this position, of course it is far more complicated than this. In a certain sense, in the last hundred years, we have a lot of art, we have a lot of science, we have a lot of technology, and analytic philosophy wants to strictly praise the scientific, logical, whatever that is intertangled, part of our thinking, and say that is success, and feel that part a lot, with it being complicated, and the continent wants to feel that art and meaning deeper than having straight, strict black and white, uh, objective, perspectival, subjective truth is more what is meaningful in life. Now, I do lean a bit towards the German and the French. I think that actually our brain is far more emotive than it is at all quantitative and has been for far longer and that this is firmly established, I would say, is the best guess in the social sciences, and I'm not a professional social science, uh, scientist unless this is anything like that, and I wouldn't qualify it as such. I'm not doing quantitative, in fact, I am avoiding, as I am increasingly saying, quantitative reasoning here at all, and I have barely used it at all here. But you understand me plenty, which means that you reading me, my facial expressions and voice, and understanding all of these things and words and emotions interwoven is prior to and then rewoven as texts and quantitative reasoning, which increases with nomadic tribes gathering into city-state empires. The time when you find Greek and Indian and Chinese philosophy asking similar questions, which we have all reason to believe the Hawaiians and Tibetans and others asked around the campfire before they had texts and be like, well, are you sure, Steve? But we don't have that written down. 
all of that is gone. We have bones, we have fragments buried. If they, as uh, people say, we get what's buried, maybe that's most important to people. Maybe that's just what seems to persist because anything above ground, you know, maybe everything was above ground. People barely buried anything. We have what's buried or drawings in caves. We don't have what's worn away other than that. Why do you think that physically is? It's not that we revered what's in caves, although if that's what processed after a thousand years and we saw it, we might revere what's in caves rather than what's above the surface. But that wouldn't be anything like we like to do things underground as opposed to out in the clear light of day, would it? So that said, I don't think that the mind is ultimately logical in a quantitative way. I think that uh, formal logic is actually mistaken significantly, and I believe that is late Wittgenstein. But unfortunately, I was taught by people, um, I fortunately was taught by people who say, unfortunately, these are the continentalish but still analytic types I, I talked about. I talk to people in their office hours back in the day, and I have been inspired the whole time to say that people do not fully understand Wittgenstein or what he is saying. And I happen to like internet working Greek, Indian, Chinese thought to fully, uh, to further, not fully, I don't think we can fully explain apples, but further explain why Wittgenstein and looking at things as several simple elements interwoven rather than a basement element of logic or numbers or even emotions, or even Nietzsche saying things are power or Freud saying things are sex. Wittgenstein says you have to beware of the uh, lure of the secret seller. Be careful, and he means Freud. He's thinking of Freud. Be careful of thinking everything in society boils down to one element, like sex or power. It would be a lot of sex and power, internet worked with the color blue, and then everything else, and zebras. But it would be very much sex and less zebras, but it wouldn't be essentially sex, because that's one dominant element in everything altogether. That's much more Wittgensteinian thinking, that it is forms of life interwoven out of several simple elements of Otherwise, children could not learn the patterns and then interweave into them so easily without us ever explaining apples in full paragraphs. That being said, I am very frustrated with analytic philosophy. Further, continuing to try to talk as if we are fully logical robotic beings when that is just simply not what the social sciences assert, while analytic philosophy asserts to be on the side of sciences and people see continental thought and postmodernism as more artistic. Well, I come more from the American kind of pragmatist tradition, which would suggest actually analytic positivistic thought is missing several things almost on purpose because they can't fully listen to continentalish Wittgenstein, who loved Schopenhauer and Nietzsche as a youth and then continued to think in rather surprisingly Buddhist ways. I will get to all of my rantings and ravings about that in further talks. But the term analytic is first used by American philosophy professors in the 1930s, so again, it's less than 100 years old. It is a very hard, if you look through the catalogs, it is a very serious distinction. Like, but it's less than 100 years old. Wisdom might be earlier. <laughs> you can't ask the analytics. Uh, you know, it would involve history, you know, and anything other than, I guess, physics and spherical cows. So increasingly, I mean strict formalities and formal cows, of course, in nice attire. You know, I was raised a proper lady. So increasingly, by Americans and British, British professors are using the word to distinguish themselves after World War II through the 30s and then right after the 40s to distinguish themselves from Germans and French who follow Hegel and Heidegger increasingly, etc. Of course, that is with the 30s, 40s, etc. Yes, and we'll talk more of that with Heidegger and notebooks of... Several assorted colors. So, as we will Wittgenstein. Analytic philosophy focuses on logic and language, prioritizing the objective and impersonal, the universal. I'm going to be talking a lot about Alice in Wonderland this semester. There is a lot of play in Lewis Carroll. When do you say things universally and when do you say things generally? Like, if I say zebras are awesome, do I mean that universally or generally? Pick. You know, I want you to choose. I want you to be more formal here. Frege revolutionized logic. Uh, again, I am an, uh, I am thankful I took class with Sluga. That you basically uh, Frege is one of the guys who here you can like his work. Uh, I definitely like Sluga's historical and psychological perspective. That actually, when you look at what Frege is doing, and then you like Wittgenstein, you can see what Frege is doing, and it isn't entirely formal and pretty. <laughs> that is debatable, and that's where we're going to go with it. So. Frege uses mathematical structures to describe logical reasoning as the word psychology is becoming increasingly a thing. We, people didn't have the word psychology to talk about what would normally be a lot of philosophy before that, and in most cultures. Talking about the mind meaning truth, talking about talking, how talking works, is very much brain studies. Plenty, perfectly can I have no problem with that. And I'm going to continue to do philosophy and history of thought and draw it together. 
In a certain sense, philosophy has a dual role. It's good to mention here. I did not before. Philosophy is both history of thought, which is why I'm frustrated with analytic thought, and increasingly focusing on itself and not even Greek stuff, it would seem. I have to insist. I've been told differently, but I don't see it. But it also uh, is not only history of thought, but also the examination of truth, meaning talking about talking. So you not only have talking about talking what is truth here that I'm in these words I'm telling you, but it also is the history of anybody talking about talking, the Mayans, the Indians. It could be. It isn't here in America. But I do it that way, whether or not it is or isn't. So it is, you know, right then. So the term analytic, again, is used to separate off the Anglophonic world, and increasingly after World War II and against communism suggests that actually capitalist world Anglophonic power hour does indeed have truth, and you don't have to examine the social circumstances or historical circumstances, because if we power through with science hard enough and remain privately Protestant, we have enough truth in our lives. Which means we do not have to continental-wise, artistic, romantic-wise, examine Hegel, social perspective, revolution. Did I mention Martin Luther King Jr. was into Hegel? There there's a lot of ways where if people don't need social change in their lives, they would valorize the strict logical motions of science, which I don't think actually exist, but they would valorize that or morality or something and then sit on it and say, this is golden. If you were frustrated with the situation, you might want more artistic passion, romance, social change. And it does look like these camps have solidified in these ways, I do suggest, and can so quite wordlessly with these words. So analytic philosophy is focusing on the universal. And again, that's very frege. It's mathematical. Truth is algebraic. Well, as I've already said, it is, and but it plenty isn't. How much of your life and understandings are mathematical? I mean, and I would mean, say that to economists and mathematicians too, if you think about it. How much of math is quantity? How many, yeah, how many math problems you done? Is that important? Russell, who saw in Frege's logic a method for clarifying and solving philosophical problems, argued that the unclear and unnecessary can be stripped away, very analytic, strip away anything social and contextual, reveal the clear and objective truth. Much as math strips away the qualities of things, leaving bare quantities and sets, almost. Couldn't be purely, would still have to function, I would argue, but hey. Much as math strips away a lot of, let's say, the qualities of things to analyze them in pure terms of pure quantity, but that would be pure mathematics, never practical because practical mathematics would have to mix quantities with something else internetworked. Russell follows Kant, the last link between the two traditions, who wanted to legitimize philosophy as a distinct natural science. Is philosophy a distinct natural science with absolute facts? Is any science? You can ask. Using logic such that the subjective could be stripped away and the objective truth established. Strip away the emotions, you have bare math, right? I'm with Wittgenstein. Do you feel a math problem fits without emotions at the end? You're probably conditioned to feel math problems fit. You cannot pay attention to your emotions and the feeling that math problems fit, and neither does Russell too much. Unlike, he well, he doesn't anymore. Unlike Hegel, who argued that subjectivity and objectivity are two sides, which you'll notice actually is what I'm doing here, back and forth and back and forth. Two sides of the same coin, which is more Wittgenstein and more woven forms of life. Susan's wrong about that. That's interweaving subjective and objective truth like that. We do that all day long, Wittgenstein says, but he goes too far in being practical, I suppose. Russell maintains Kant's exclusive distinction between objectivity and subjectivity. Now that is very important here. Both Kant and Hegel believe in objectivity and subjectivity, but Kant says the two are black and white distinct. No pun intended. Hegel says the two are interconnected and interwoven. Wittgenstein after Nietzsche goes much more rough. It's much more zoological than something triangular and pyramid shaped or mathematical for Hegel. It is for Hegel more so than later thinkers following Hegel because it's a big post-Darwinian ecosystem. Nietzsche is the first philosopher to come along post-Hegel continental after Darwin. He's like, look at all these apes here, you know? We're going to get much more strictly into that, but that, if you tell people this is all a bunch of apes, we do not progress with the sciences at all. We are simply using technology. Uh, I believe Arthur C. Clarke said we have uh, primitive, uh, we have primitive brains with godlike technology. If you believe that at all, you are simply and suddenly more Schopenhauer and Nietzsche than you are with anyone thinking more science means more logic and honesty out of humanity after World War I and World War II. And you are welcome to think in all directions from here, which is what 
All this is doing and what you are doing, whether you see the larger patterns of what you are doing and feeling all like others who are not demons or not. On all sides of it, the more you empathize, the more you talk through it, the more you can easily see all sides of it, because that's what tribes have been doing in any religion or science and gathering larger empires the whole time with it for better and worse. And these empires are so gathered, with the French and Germans secondary rich and wealthy, and they think truth is more romantic and subjective, and the top dogs in the world think science is strict and logical. How do you think that happened? If I told you that's like ancient Egypt or China, would you believe me? Maybe you'd distrust me and the Chinese. I don't know. In a certain sense, things feel they fit and they are trusted or they are not, and this does not resolve with any years of religion or science. If Christianity did not resolve human beings in being more trustable people, and you can talk to Christians about their fellow Christians any day of the week, you know, here or at Lake Wobegon, basically, if Christianity and science have not made people trustworthy by now, then these are the beings you trust and distrust. In a certain sense, the battle for all this is already won. I mean, this is human beings liking science and religion and art and all of it, and they're leaning this way and that, but it's actually all of it. And you're all of it, you know, whether you like it or not. How much do you use quantities or not? Are you afraid of them? Do you do them with everything? No, that's not science, that's not religion, that's not art, that's not anything. It's better to present the wider view, the historical view which human beings want and seek and don't, quite naturally. Quotey, quotey we'll get to post-structuralism and post-modernism and the natural. I come from the hate, so it's rather Mr. Natural, you know, with all of that. It ain't none too purdy, is what I mean. So, Russell says there's two schools of philosophy. He says continental and British. He doesn't even say analytic much. So while Hegel, he does use it, but in different, it's sort of like uh, Marx kind of uses the word Marx. Uh, he uses the word capital and capital, yeah, but he doesn't use the word capitalist much, actually, in his work, Marx. That's after. And certainly the word Marxist he would not use. I almost used. Uh, you can catch. Russell argues that mathematics and science work through eliminating contradictions, because we have, right? Yay, that's this. No. Uh, to discard the subjective and historical, leaving only the objective and universal. Have computers done that? The internet so far? It looks like they feed back into everything, almost like we're involved with them. And that philosophy should do the same. I heard the, you know, seen the movie Her? Wittgenstein followed Russell in his early period, inventing the truth table method we still use today as basis of logic. I am using this class, uh, Talk for Logic. And I do like teaching people truth tables. I have videos up in my playlist teaching people truth tables right now. And then I like showing people how that is not entirely how we use and and or, because Wittgenstein himself, who invented those truth tables, said and and or are elastic in ways I like to use a buffet for, um, as a simple concrete example of how and and or could be almost interchangeable in certain circumstances as we use language and many cultures would because and and or are elastic and actually kind of stretch back and forth depending on context. But in formal logic, which operates like algebra or a ancestor of telephone systems and computer programs with Bool, which is the groove Frege is digging on very much, and Lewis Carroll was a bit loving and hating and afraid of. That if we follow the truth table, but then we understand Wittgenstein distance himself from Russell and believe that objective truth in the world and subjective truth in the head, he specifically screws with that. We aren't simply subjective in our heads. We aren't simply objective out in the world. You look at apples from a certain side, you understand you have a subjective perspective in the objective world, and we interweave that all day long. So you never have the duck rabbit as just a duck. You never have the duck rabbit as just a rabbit. You have subjective objective processes such that if I tell you Susan's wrong about that, you understand I mean there's this. I don't say that. You don't say that in words. I mean, Susan's off on her subjective plane, which is bad. And you understand me like that, which is already depending on motions of thought and emotions and people and things such that you understand objectivist and subjectivist truth. And there was no hiccup there as I interwove the two. I don't know how you'd have objective truth without somebody being wrong. And that would involve necessarily processes of identifying and dealing with subjectivity, with being right in a new way or wrong in a bad way that is not the collective whole. That would be just tribal reasoning. The brain has not significantly evolved since the 1900s. I would, I, I, let me, you know, I'm certain that people scrambled their brains a couple of times, like Kermit the Frog, you know, almost did. Like, as far as having a bunch of computers, I don't know, given uh, sharing laptops with African children, though, and some experiments, why that would be logical reasoning as opposed to human reasoning interconnecting with everything and being able to pivot off each element into another element and interweave as the whole. That would be what it more would, which is why Wittgenstein would say, 
Unlike Kant, an analytic thought would say, you cannot separate the purely objective apart from the subjective, and that means there's more talking and truth to do. A lot of times people here misunderstand, and they think postmodernism, or some later Wittgenstein, and saying truth is a construct, they think that means it's invisible. A building's a construct. Does that make it invisible or not real? A building's mortal. Does that mean it doesn't exist? No, it was built. I got people building outside. I got to try to give lectures, you know, during the whole time here. And I got cats that want me to open the window. I can't, you know. Many conflicting subjective perspectives as my objective-ish situation which I have to reason through and imperfectly. So, given all of that, we cannot simply separate my interests from the world or your interests or from the head or from subjectivity. Like, that's just not psychology and it's just not anything. But analytic philosophy wants to maintain it loves science and won't listen to the social sciences. So we're still there after all this time. So hopefully you can go somewhere anybody knows anything other than that, is what I'd tell you if you're a philosophy major. And I mean, you can go here, there, anywhere, apparently, because it takes all kinds. So logical positivists, such as the Vienna Circle, picked up and developed Wittgenstein's earlier work, hoping that philosophy, <laughs> philosophical problems would disappear if logically analyzed. That certainly is not society. This continues to be the dominant position of British and American analytic thought today, known as positivism. Since the 70s, it's quieter, but it hasn't changed its tack or tactics. Uh, through British utilitarianism and American pragmatism, I'm sorry, Positivism is still dominant. Uh, British utilitarianism and American pragmatism are exist, but they are definitely sidelined as secondary. The uh, truth is somewhat subjective in practice, and I do know ins and outs of how brutal utilitarianism can be, and think about the, co the communist world and capitalist world as moralistic and brutally utilitarian. Capitalism and socialism alike. Who stands for principles versus brutally utilitarian using things in whatever context it needs to? And everybody afraid of all sides of that. In ethics, logic, etc. Russell is afraid of that. After World War I, he's afraid people are going to use science however they want, and he wants to found science in principles. Glad we did that. Now think about if we didn't. Both argue, sides here, that cons, uh, pragmatism and positivism in America argue that concepts and descriptions are true insofar as they are useful and practical, I mean utilitarianism, sorry, and pragmatism, and that there is no objective or exclusive truth beyond that and subjective use. You will notice that is actually the position I am more taking, which I believe is taking both sides duck-rabbit style rather than hardlining on one side or the other. Notice, in fact, I am not saying there is no truth. I am not saying there is absolute truth. I am saying there is some and some truth relatively, which is more pragmatism than positivism. More the duck rabbit of subjectivity, objectivity interlaced altogether than it is one versus the other shades of gray, which is more complicated and more pivot worthy than black and white exclusively. So, both sides, uh, yes, continental thinkers have only recently, in French and German, taken up this distinction because they didn't have to talk about themselves as anything other than philosophy here, and then, of course, as analytics are like, well, we're not you, they have increasingly saying, so those analytics are other than us continental, you know, ties. So in America, there was a surge of interest, in fact, in continental thought and the political upheaval of the 1960s. Um, and courses on phenomenology, existentialism, structuralism, post-structuralism, and postmodernism, all popular in history departments, plenty, all popular in English departments, so much, all popular in art departments, so much, existentialism, postmodernism, you know, I'm going to do some art movements with all of this this semester. And again, all of that is invisible, uh, largely. Um, I have a good example, Judith Butler, a lot of people, of course, who are conservative probably don't know who that is or hate her. Um, either way, it's rather bivalent, you know, but Judith Butler is possibly the highest paid person in Berkeley. She is a feminist. She teaches in the rhetoric department, not in the philosophy department. I believe still does. Uh, Richard Rorty complained at Stanford, across the water, I say, lousy horse farm here in Berserkla town. Those folks, I think Stanford wanted to get involved with Cal. They didn't let him. So he's like, I'm gonna build a college. I'm a horse farm. Good luck. I hope that works. Basically over at, you know, across the water there at Stanford, uh, at lousy horse farm. Basically, I'm being silly, of course. I have no hate for Stanford. I'm just being mocky, stupid. Again, there's some kind of axe. I don't know what that is. Basically, that you study, I wouldn't, you know, I'm from Cal. We study, of course, uh, that there's folks over, uh, Richard Rorty basically says, I'm a, a professor of trendy studies before he died at Stanford. I don't teach in the philosophy department. Why? Because he's into continental philosophy plenty too much. And Wittgenstein, pragmatism. 
Cornel West. Uh, you may have heard him, seen him in the Matrix once. He's also a very much a pragmatist existentialist. He's not an analytic positivist. Uh, I believe he is now teaching. Uh, I learned a lot of the Graduate Theological Union, a lot of uh, Indian Chinese thought. I believe Cornell West is no longer at Harvard. He had some back and forth with Summers telling him his thinking is not actual real thought and objective truth. And he went off back into theology land where he can study more history and thought in a wider perspective historically. A lot of people are afraid of religion, wouldn't realize you can go to religion to figure out a larger picture of thought. <laughs> And a lot of modern folks are really willing to look into. It's tribalism. You know, it's how departments, history is, as far as we can see and feel. I have to feel it, though. So basically, while analytic thought, like Russell, seeks to strip away the subjective and historical, revealing the objective and universal, and then you can just study whatever uh, math and Americans are doing, because it's right there perfectly, continental thought focuses on the union of the perspective and personal together with the social and historical. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, the two forerunners of existentialism, argued that philosophy was always a personal confession, an experience of personal struggle. They agree with Hegel that reality is composed of perspectives, and it's subjective-objective altogether as we experience it, uh, that we are in agreement and disagreement all the time. But they reject Hegel's claim to have revealed the objective and total unity of the full set of chess moves of subjective perspectives, which is what Hegel is trying to do. Hegel is trying to show how history builds all the subjective perspectives into a white final objectivity, which is science. This is then rejected by other continental thinkers after Hegel, who realize that there is no complete chess moves, and that increasingly with Darwin and the world wars. Think about what the ascendancy of Europe, power, money, science does to a lot of folks after they see World War I and World War II, and that that is the broader context of all of these smart, smart people duking it out over truth and meaning, whether it's more art, whether it's more science. I don't have to take a side, do I? Neither do you. It's all interwoven for Wittgenstein. So rather than strip away the subjective, as Russell says, or claim to have built objectivity out of the sum of subjectivities as Hegel had, existentialists, which is very uh, after Nietzsche and Heidegger, Sartre and French thought, as it begins and then proceeds through structuralism, post-structuralism, and postmodernism, all of which we will cover, that existentialists argue that, and I always say, you know, in a trench coat, smoking the cigarette life, she is cruel, you know, it is very passion in a trench coat. What is this, a trench coat convention? Uh, that they claim, uh, unlike uh, Russell and Positivist, claim to have built objectivity, um, or Hegel says he built it out of the subjective rather than the objective pieces for Russell. Existentialists argue that the problem of objectivity and subjectivity is always open-ended and painful. That's very much, she is cruel. The forms of life that they never resolve. That was Borat. Uh, and that never it was, therefore, the responsibility of individuals to discover truth for themselves. If individual, and, and that doesn't mean individually rather than collectively, if individual social and historical context is stripped away in the interests of simplicity and mathematical precision, the complex meaning. I would say the emotional interconnections and empathy as well, um, of the problem likewise disappears, which does little to solve the problem as we live it and think it, which does involve several different diverse things interwoven as thought and consciousness. Sight, sound is perception, as well as perception, imagination, words, emotions, and everything. This has no simple answer, remains open-ended, and that is the life and thinking you live as you, your innermost self. And so are these ancient Indians and Egyptians. It's probably why they asked similar questions before and after around the campfires. So, which is stronger or more accurate? I'll ask as quest final questions here. Describing things simply or complexly? Should we try for the clarity of black and white or for the complexity of shades of gray? If you want certainty and exclusivity in life, in many things you want, then there will be terrible consequences unless barriers are held in place. Simple absolute is best. If you want complexity and inclusivity, which is also necessary for life, when experimentation and alternatives are safe and permissible, complex relative shades of gray are best. And which one can you have in what situation without the other ever so complexly? You would have to have a dense network to have one be more so rather than the other and rely on everything else staying somewhat the same. Should philosophy close more than it opens or open more than it closes? On the analytic side, reason should bring us to secure understanding, such that we have a foundational basis for making important decisions. 
On the continental side, much of what is important to us, such as social struggle or our attitudes towards death, are murky and not exclusively black and white, which is what makes them so dynamic, dramatic, emotional, and meaningful. Clarity can be relative. Ambiguity and plurality are as much our reality as clarity and singularity. There is balance to be struck between clarity and depth. In fact, that would be my words, your understandings is already a balance, but just like we say now, there really is no chemical balance in the head. There really is, perhaps, as far as the head sees it and doesn't, balance in life. Perhaps. Let's leave that positive. May as well. Either way. Analytic, uh, these Greek skeptics say life is fair and life is unfair. How'd that happen? I don't know. Can't fully figure it out. Can somewhat, though. Analytic philosophy has been accused of being socially impotent, removing the situation and saying meaning is static and universal does not allow for social differences and change. Now, why would this dominate philosophy departments in the 1950s? And say really social context and perspective doesn't matter, and that really if we just power through with more science and or Protestantism in private, that's fine. I can't think of a single reason why that would be in this day and age and week. You know, I, I just don't understand. So I'm going to not understand further. Hence, feminists and critics of racism often turn to continental thought, which is Judith Butler, Emil Kalia. Questions of social identity, repression, ideology are all declared meaningless by the analytic positivists, the more positivist they lean. Even though many people, particularly intellectuals, find these quite meaningful, and guess what? This is Berkeley. So at UC Berkeley, where uh, I studied, am not now, I teach at BCC, Berkeley City College, the Community College at Berkeley, have loved doing it, this is 14 years now, Continental thought thrives in the English and rhetoric departments at Berkeley, particularly the latest French thought of Bart, Foucault, Deleuze, Derrida, I suggest Bataille, especially nowadays, but don't read him. While these are almost invisible, uh, these are almost all invisible in the philosophy department. They go too far. You can take a Nietzsche or a Hegel class. That's still important enough. Somebody who's speaking English ought to know they exist. Beyond that, again, it's like not to be integrated, it would seem, decades later. So this is why Judith Butler, again, teaches in the rhetoric department. Why Rorty taught in the, uh, in the comparative studies department of Stanford rather than the philosophy department. Because wisdom is nice and, I guess, emotionless, you know, and so is thought and talking to anyone. I think we don't want that to be the case. So some continent, how could we want it? Some continental thinkers have admired analytic thought for its clarity and I admire the common language movement. One of the things I take positively from analytic philosophy is say common words. They don't all do that at all. Oh my God, reading any philosophy essays from France to Germany or even, you know, analytic Americas, it can be maddening. But the common language movement means you can use simple words and that's, clear, and that's very Wittgenstein. One of the notable things about Nietzsche, but also even more Wittgenstein, clear, simple words is often most fruitful and best. I'm going to get to Poe and all of that later. But, so while Nietzsche is clear in his writing while asking deep questions, Hegel, Heidegger, and later French thinkers can be uh, confound even experts. Uh, Monique Schneider, a French philosopher, she got a German name though, and psychoanalyst who admires the clarity of analytic thinkers, said that she attended Lacanian psychoanalysis lectures. I won't explain those right now. I don't think I or Lacan could. And again, he's gone, which overjoyed students would leave saying it was wonderful. I couldn't understand a thing, assuming that the incomprehensible, if I just dizzy you with philosophy, that must be profound. People feel that way, whether or not they're strict analytics or not with the dizzying language. It's rather distracting. On an episode of The Simpsons, Homer watches a David Lynch movie and he says it's brilliant. I have no idea what it means. And again, I like David Lynch. I may get to explaining some of that a little. Not fully. How could I? How dare, you know, how dare you? But... While surrealists such as Lynch enjoy international ob intentional obfuscation, which is very poetic and surreal, shunning simple narratives and morals, that doesn't mean, again, surrealism isn't clear or direct or brute. It believes in being all of that, as does art. You know, a tout brute. So yeah, it's a little modern. Um, again, I like the glass of water. It's like next to this glass of water in an art gallery. You mean to say that this isn't a glass of water, it's an oak tree? What kind of idiot do you think I am? And the answer is yes, this is no longer a glass of water. This is now an oak tree to piss everyone off oh so clearly, you know? Because it's playing with the kind of stuff I am right here, overlappingly. When you see a glass of water, it is and isn't, and you and I know that weirdly. Artists, they are liars. Given the divide between the two traditions, what should we do as the study of history of thought? Rather than swear cultural allegiance to either side, of course, what I'm doing here is making it hard for you to do so. 
We should, by pivoting, we should examine every side that we can see, and you can develop your thinking one way's other, I can't stop you, any way you like. Whether or not you close out answers or open up questions, we are indeed, in doing philosophy or anything, and we just talk about all talking and meaning and all that's on the table in philosophy, or should be... That's why we're training ourselves to think creatively and critically. Creatively, pro, critically, anti. Um, uh, opening things up, growing things out fruitfully, and paring things down and stripping away things in context and other elements and factors. Complementary wise and contradictory wise. This is why we study a great range of thought, with all its disagreements and oppositions, as we learn just as much from a philosophy to which we are opposed as we do to a philosophy with which we agree. That said, hopefully you'll agree and disagree with me. That is my long talk. I did take tangents. And that is the analytic and the continental. And it is appropriate, thus, to say while it was continental and then analytic, if you listen through, it was actually analytic in spite of that, and then continental. A to the B to the C. Either way. So, much love and happiness. I have cats. Over here, hey buddy. Whoa. Yes. It's one of Kant's fantastic trained cats. How clear or murky does my cat see the world? I'm not sure. I'll talk to him about it later. Yes? So anyway, with Kant and his magical dancing cats, um, we will return at some point, and I will see you, if I ever see you, or my cats. <laughs>